So I'd like to begin with a short offensive film I stole from Microsoft. You really shouldn't applaud me. I didn't make that film. I just stole it. Um, so I've come to talk to you about the anti-smack topic of dying. It's unfortunately not very sexy. It doesn't involve Reboas. It doesn't involve ECMO. It just involves dying people. And I've got 20 minutes to convince you that sometimes actually dying is the right thing to do. So death's important because there's a whole lot of stuff that happens to you during your life. And more importantly, there's a whole lot of stuff that happens to you during your patient's life that you only get one shot at, because at the end of their life, they're going to die. If you screw it up, then they're dead. You don't get a second chance at this. It's also, interestingly, the only thing I can guarantee 100% that all of you will have in common with the patients you look after. You are all going to die, as are they gets happier, I promise. There's some jokes coming. Um, so part of the problem is that although for many years pat our patients have trusted us with their lives, it seems increasingly they're starting to distrust us with their deaths. The media are starting to realize there's a whole lot of stuff we're doing to people that maybe they don't want. And there's been a series of books published, written mostly by doctors, but not all, talking about their end of life experiences looking after patients and patients increasingly coming out saying that maybe doing everything isn't actually what we wanted. This has led to several professional societies trying to address this. You've probably all seen the Choosing Wisely campaigns. It's basically saying don't be a dick. These are things that aren't going to help people. Why are you doing them? Please stop doing them. My own professional body is the one at the top. It says, for patients with limited life expectancy, do not put them in ICU, ventilate them, and keep them there until they die. Now, this is really just stating the bleeding obvious. You can see the cardiologists have one. Even the oncologists, kudos to them, have one as well. So choosing wisely campaigns have taken over because we're obviously not choosing wisely. So it's fair to ask, what the hell has this got to do with me? I'm an intensivist. Um, there are people better placed to talk about this and they're palliative care physicians. I'm not a palliative care physician, but I believe we are quite lucky and privileged as intensivists because most palliative care physicians are like vampires. They have to be invited in. And many people don't invite palliative care physicians in. Other doctors may not realize that actually their patient is dying. We, by nature of things such as medical emergency teams, rapid response teams, we've inserted ourselves in a situation where we are called whenever someone is dying. So we are there, better placed 24-7, to meet dying people and help work on them to the point that we can decide whether we think they're dying or not. So the topic of my talk is the meaning of everything. And everything is subject to multiple perspectives depending on who you're talking to. So I'm going to talk really briefly about four perspectives. One is the doctor, one is the patient and their family, one is the, and the fourth one, sorry, is the health economist, who you don't really get to hear much from these days. 
Dying is an interesting thing because the history of dying has changed significantly probably over the last four to five hundred years. We as society have been increasingly changed how we have been exposed to dying. 400, 500 years ago, there were things like the Black Death that wiped out almost 50% of the European population. Infant mortality was somewhere between 30 and 50%. So everyone was exposed to dying on a regular basis, to the point that the Catholic Church wrote this treatise, the Ars Moriendi, where people were encouraged to be awake and prepare for their death with their family present. So there wasn't pretty much anyone who hadn't seen someone die because everyone was surrounded by death as a constant presence. What happened is that doctors came along and screwed it all up. And we took people away from dying in their community with their family and we took them to these magic buildings that we built called hospitals. And we gave them, rather than being allowed to be awake and make justifications and peace with themselves and with their God, we gave them drugs and put them off to sleep. And we gave them painkillers to make sure that they died in comfort as we deemed. So the medicalization of death and this building of what's been called the medical industrial complex led to patients essentially being removed from society. If you think back, those of you, well, all of us who are here involved in patient care, before you got involved in this, how many of us had actually ever seen a dead person? Unless you worked in the funeral industry before you became a doctor, which would be a slightly odd career path, admittedly. Then it's unlikely you've actually seen that many dead people. And most members of the public haven't actually seen dead people. So we built this mystique around what dying people look like. And this feeds a lot of things. It used to be that no one talked about sex. Now, everyone talks about sex. I'm sick of people talking about sex. I don't even have Tinder on my phone. I'm happily married with two children. But it seems that, observationally at least, we've moved away from sex being a taboo to death being a new taboo. Now, this is the contralateral opinion. This is from an advanced care planner down in Christchurch in New Zealand that I really like which is talking about death won't make you dead any more than talking about sex will make you pregnant. Think about the language that we use to talk about death. Think about the euphemisms that we use to actually avoid saying the dead word. We talk about people passing on, going to a better place. And you hear these in family conversations to the point that you think, do they even know what I'm talking about? About 15 years ago, I moved to New Zealand. Um, I'd come from a very conservative central London teaching hospital and no one there said anything that would offend either the patients or their colleagues. And I'd been there about two weeks in New Zealand, and I was in my first family meeting as a registrar with one of my senior colleagues who I now work with today. And we were having a meeting that was essentially to inform a family of a patient with severe traumatic brain injury that they were not going to survive. And the neurosurgeon was about 20 slices into the MRI, and was explaining in incredible depth what the core date was and what it meant and was talking about the EEG. And it was clear this family were just looking around going, what the hell is going on? And my, my colleague stopped, leaned forward, touched the father of this patient on the knee and said, listen, his brain is fucked. He is fucked. He is not going to survive. And the voices in my head were going, what the, what have I, <laughs> what is this country? <laughs> um, but what happened next is that the father stood up, shook my colleague's hand, said, thank you for explaining this in a way I can understand. <laughs> and they went outside and we turned off the machine and allowed him to die. So, as I alluded to earlier, I've used this slide before, it's still my favorite, we are all going to die, you are all going to die. <laughs> the only thing that's changed don't applaud, I don't have time. <laughs> the only thing that's changed is how you're going to die. Now, what's interesting is if you look at life expectancy and lifespan, life expectancy over time has remained relatively unchanged. Despite medicine's advances, most people seem to die at the longest around about 120. What's changed is life expectancy, not lifespan. Sorry, I got this the wrong way around. So this leads to another good joke about how culturally determined we are with regard to how we die. Different people have different perceptions about how they're going to die. So the effect of this, when you look at, think back to the great celebrity cull of 2016, when all those celebrities were wiped off the face of the planet, these two stood out for me. The first one was Zaza Gabor. She was 99 years old. 
She was wheelchair bound following a stroke and a motor car accident. She'd been admitted with a broken hip and had been in hospital for a, a long period of time. And these are the quotes from the media stories. If you look at the black box, we tried everything, but our heart just stopped. It was, and that was it. Even the ambulance tried very hard to get her back, but there was no way. If you look at Chuck Berry's death, it was reported that he arrested at 12.40. He was a 90-year-old man. He could not be resuscitated, and resuscitation was stopped at 1.26. That's 46 minutes of resuscitation on a 90-year-old man. I'm just giving you some context. I'm not from California. This may be normal. This isn't normal where I work. So, in terms of dying trajectories, you've probably seen these graphs before. These are things that palliative care physicians are very good at. You're talking of patients, if you take an average general practice in the UK, 25% of patients will die from cancer. They have a high risk, have a high level of function, and they deteriorate slowly over a period of time. You have people with these chronic relapsing diseases who have a general decline in baseline, but what happens over time is that they get these small intervals where they get worse, but they never get back to baseline. And these intervals of deterioration that are often marked by hospital admission get closer and closer together. And finally, you have people who are just dying from frailty and old age. And these account for about 35% of most people in general practices. There's a small minority of people who die from trauma. So about 10% of deaths in any GP practice in the UK will die from a sudden significant event. So the downside to this is when you meet someone for the first time, either locked in their car by the roadside or in their bed, if you're a paramedic attending someone at home or in your ICU and your ED, is everyone looks the same. You've got no idea where these patients are on their trajectory, and you don't know if there's someone who's dying from an irreversible process, or whether this is someone who is actually worth, in quotes, saving. So what this leads to is a way in which we address these people quite differently. Now, here's a theoretical patient. Something bad happens, and they would otherwise die. What an appropriate medical intervention is, is to get in there, and try and make things better and get them back to baseline so they can become a good, responsible, tax-paying member of society to pay for the health care that they've just received for free if you work where I work. What often happens, however, is this. You have a patient who's been deteriorating for some time, and the medical intervention occurs here. And what you've done is you've just delayed their death. Their quality of life is poor, and because you've intervened, you've spent a lot of money, and you've not actually changed the outcome, which is they're dead, and they're dead only shortly after the period you would otherwise have died if you hadn't have intervened. So the problem with everything is it means a heck of a lot of stuff. But every day we see people in ICU, we limit what we do. We don't refer everyone with, lung, with severe deteriorating lung function for heart-lung transplants. But it seems odd that the only thing we write down that people shouldn't receive is CPR, even if by the time they need it, they've already deteriorated to the point it's of no benefit, as in Jar Jar and Chuck. You also have this conveyor belt, where patients who present to the emergency department are carried through till they reach ICU, because they're intubated by someone else. And what happens at any of these stages is determined by the clinical environment that they're in. Now, as doctors, we have very different viewpoints on things. We're reflective of the culture and our colleagues and the mentality of our profession. And there are different ways we view things differently. What drives a surgeon is not the same thing that drives an intensivist. So the way we look at things and the way we determine what we're going to do to either delay death or prevent it has a big impact upon what actually happens to our patients. Now, we're very bad at intensivists, it would seem, at actually knowing what the outcomes of our patients are going to be. This is a remarkable study, these two, not because of what they did when they intervened on people, but the baseline group for patients who had been ventilated just for more than two days was that only a third of them could actually walk out of hospital. Now, as intensivists, we all give each other high fives when we get a patient alive back to the ward, never mind actually finding out what happens to them when they leave the hospital. So, it would be great if there was some scale we could use to assess prospectively whether the chance of someone leaving a hospital alive was actually going to work. And here is one such proposed scale. It's seven metrics. There's a score of 1 to 10 for each one. And the total score of more than 35 is deemed an acceptable quality of life. Now, there's a problem with this scale, is that it's actually for dogs. So <laughs> this is my dog. He's called Monkey. He's 13 years old. 
When I left New Zealand four days ago, he had a score about 45, heading towards 50. And my wife's texting me every day because he's coming towards the end of his natural life. So vets are pretty good at this sort of thing. My argument is that we're actually not very good at this sort of thing. I'm not advocating euthanasia. I need to go ahead and say that straight out. The reason we're not very good at this sort of thing is that we tend to overestimate the benefit of things that we do, and we underestimate the harm of the interventions that we do. What we suffer from is an optimism bias. And we have this not just as a folly à deux, where there's ourselves and the patient, who will always err on the side of good things happening. We have a folly à trois, where we have ourselves, the patient, and the family often involved, that we always interpret the same things in different ways. There's a study looking at patients who were presented to hospices who were being looked after by palliative care physicians. And they asked the palliative care physician how long they thought the patient had. And what they found was there was a massive variation in prediction to when they thought they were going to die to when they actually died, almost tenfold in some cases. But the interesting part was that the variation was determined by how long the doctor had known the patient. So the longer they'd known them, the more likely they were to assume that they were going to live a lot longer than they actually did. So when you have conversations like this, you have a doctor saying, you are dying. We can give you chemotherapy that, will prolong, that may prolong your life, but you're still going to die. What the patient hears is often something quite different. And the patient is informed not so much by what the doctor says, but what the media says. Now, the media will say, that when, well, the media will never say, the doctor told me I had two minutes to live, and two minutes later I was dead. What the media will say is, the doctor told me I had two minutes to live, and I've just run my 20th marathon. What the media will also tell you is that, the next cure for cancer is only weeks away. So you can see why there's this disconnect between what the doctor may think and what the patient may actually hear. And it's been called this conspiracy of silence. Patients with advanced cancer and their oncologists were asked, different, asked if they could both say what the prognosis was going to be. And there was a marked difference between what they reported. And most patients didn't know that their oncologists had different opinions to what they actually thought was going to happen. So if you look at these, what I find, awful statistics, as someone working in New Zealand, at least, of what happens to Californians at the end of their life, this is a report from Californian ICUs, 41% were admitted to an ICU during the last month of their life. 6% were given chemo in the last two weeks of their life. And these are patients with stage 3, stage 4 metastatic cancer. This is an awesome paper from the New England Journal. Hopefully you've seen it. It was patients with advanced metastatic lung cancer who were randomized to receive either standard oncological care or oncology care plus palliative care. And there was two major things. One wasn't that surprising, which is the patients who received palliative care were happier as they died. The most surprising fact was that the patients who received palliative care or less aggressive care lived longer than the patients who received pure oncology care. So coming to the family, what's the impact of this upon them? You'd think doing more would be better, but there's some suggestions that actually that's not the case. There's a trial a study, rather observational, obviously, that looked at patients who received life-sustaining interventions as they died. I use those words in quotes. And they randomized and they, they compared them with patients who had similar prognoses who didn't receive these interventions. And they, they followed up with the families later to find out how they felt. And the odds ratio for depression was one and a half times higher in the family members of the patients who received more invasive treatment. So I want to come to the health economist, because you don't hear much about money in healthcare. At least we don't as doctors, nurses, paramedics. And I think that's probably wrong because there's some fairly fundamental assumptions that we make. Now, most people would agree with the statement that some doctors are wasteful and should be limited in the amount of money they can spend on their patients. Much less doctors would agree with the statement, I should be limited in the amount of money I can spend on my patients. That's like that oft-reported statistic that 80% of drivers believe they are better than average, which clearly statistically can actually not be true. So, what I would like to suggest is that doctors should not be allowed to spend healthcare dollars on their patients. Now, if you work in a socialized medical system where I do, I think doctors are really bad at making decisions because we're conflicted, because we want the best for our patients, and the best often costs money. You only have to walk outside to look at the version two, three, four of the same machines that we already use every day that cost a lot more money. You should definitely go see the sponsors. Sorry, I should not 
bad mouth what their products. They're fantastic. They're awesome. You should buy them. But as doctors, we are responsible for the spending that we spend on our patients that may or may not have better outcomes. ICDs are a great example. ICDs were passed in the US for Medicare in 1985, and they were designed to be used to extend people's lives, possibly for up to a year, in people with resistant arrhythmias. Now, they were never designed to be used in people who were dying from other diseases. Now, what happened over time is that pretty much everyone got one. If you look at the orange bar, this is people over 85. This is the percentage of people having ICDs implanted. Now, what's happening is these people are not dying from primary arrhythmias. They are going on now to die from other things. Now, if you could come up with a theoretical environment where you could spend however much money you wanted and see what happened to your life expectancy, this is what happens. It doesn't have to be theoretical, because our colleagues in America have done it. And you can see the x-axis has to be extended out to cover the amount of money Americans spend on healthcare. I'm not picking on Americans, it's just this is the only access to data that I have. Not only that, but if you look at what's happened in terms of time, what advances in healthcare have done is we have allowed more children to survive to be older, which I would think we would all agree is a very good thing. Now, most of that has come from things like public health, better sewerage, vaccinations later on. But what medicine's doing now is the part at the right end of that graph is we're allowing dying people to live a lot longer. More and more people now are dying from Alzheimer's in the US simply because we are outliving all our other organs. Because we have good cardiovascular care, we have ICDs in people, to the point that our brains are now the final organ that's failing. If anyone ever cures Alzheimer's as a healthcare system, we are probably completely screwed. Because we're going to have even more people survive. And if you look at these pyramids about people who pay healthcare dollars, you start at the bottom, and in Australia particularly, you can see this boom moving up of people. A stable system needs to have more people at the bottom paying in to support the people at the top. This is not what's happening to the demographic in most countries. If you ask people what they want for their end-of-life care, you can see that most people have thought about it. Some people have had a serious conversation, but almost no one's written it down. What this leads to is this seemingly odd decision that, that most people don't want their family burdened by decisions, but actually, no one's told them. So if you're dying and you're ventilated, no one's actually there to have this conversation with them in the absence of your family. In the US, we spend, the Americans spend, three times as much money on people who die per year than people who survive per year. So this leads to my favorite quote that I've used before that I still like using. Two weeks in ICU will save you one hour of difficult conversation. We train 100% of doctors to perform CPR. We do not train 100% of doctors to have conversations about not performing CPR, and I think that is wrong. There's a whole lot of stuff we do to people <laughs> that's fun for us. <laughs> that's not fun for our patients. We love Ruboas, we love helicopters, God, we love ketamine. Patients may like ketamine, but what we don't like doing is talking about people, talking about death because it's deemed difficult. So, much like many doctors who've ever been in a helicopter have to change their Twitter profile to have a picture of them in a helicopter in it. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Palliative care has an image problem. They seem to love this obsession with leaves, where <laughs> people who come towards the winter of their lives, the autumns of their lives, are being depicted as shriveled up leaves. Now, this doesn't inspire younger people to have conversations about dying. So I want to pull on this guy. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyone here vote for him? Yeah? Are you armed? I just need to... <laughs> <laughs> I just want to check. So, look, what I want to do is borrow, Donald, borrow Donald's phrase. What I want to do is to make dying great again, and I want you guys to think about, when you go back to your hospitals, how we can have conversations, how you can have conversations with people that you meet who are critically unwell about whether doing everything is actually the right thing to do. In an effort to try and do this, a journalist from the US called Scott Simon three years ago, endeavored, and this sounds awful, endeavored to live tweet from his mother's bedside as she died. Because what he wanted to do was to try and bring back to public attention what happens to people when they die. 
So this is my last slide, because I've run out of time already. Um, this is the only palliative care joke I know, but I think it's the best palliative care joke in the world. <laughs> what, what I want to ask you to do, what I want to ask you to do is to give your patients the death that you would want. And if you can't save their life, then to save their death. The Twitter summary, 140 characters or less, is going to be stop doing shit. Now, by that I mean stuff that is going to save a life is absolutely fantastic, but stuff that is not going to save a life that's going to prolong a death, then maybe I would ask you to consider if that is in your best interests or, in fact, in your patient's best interests. Thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. Perfect. Okay, everybody, let's have a major summary comment from the Twitter sphere from Aurelia. Um, there were many, many comments on the slides, obviously. Um, but there were also things to be thought about, like um, that saying no to ICU admissions is often met with resistance within your own team and that all clinical teams need to share the same view if you want to find a way for that patient. Um, also, people said that end-of-life care discussions are often postponed or deferred to the ICU, um, whilst they should have been much earlier. Yes, and um, one thing to think about is probably if it is possible to use directives or even SOPs to improve end-of-life care and to solve the problem of things not having been discussed with the patient. Great.